This is Nightly Business Report with Bill Griffith and Sue Herrera. Our ring higher. The S&P and the Nasdaq close at record highs thanks to strong earnings from some very big companies. For sale, if it seems like everyone is making money off of your data, that's because they are. And record confidence. Americans are feeling better about their retirement, but are their financial futures really more secure? Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this Tuesday, April 23rd. And we bid you a good evening, everybody, and welcome. Sue is off tonight. Well, the stock market has come roaring back. The S&P and the NASDAQ closed at all-time highs today, making the route of late last year a distant memory. A number of things are working in the market's favor right now. Earnings have been better than expected. There was also the Fed reversing course on monetary policy and the trade talks with China seem to be progressing right now. So today new milestones. The Dow rose 145 points. That's not a record, but the Nasdaq added 105, and the S&P was up 25, both of those records. Bob Pisani was in the middle of the action today at the New York Stock Exchange. Stocks were off to the races today, picking up steam throughout the session and propelling the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq to new closing highs. Why did we have a rally? The S&P has moved to new highs on the back of four major developments. Earnings have been stabilizing. Recession fears have been fading. We've had dampening global growth fears, particularly in Europe and China, and the Federal Reserve keeping interest rate hikes on hold for the foreseeable future. Four good reasons for the markets to hit new highs. The market's got a boost from a handful of strong earnings beats today, including Dow components like Verizon, United Technologies, and Coca-Cola. Not only did they beat, but they beat by generally wider margins than typically happens. And high momentum tech and communication services names powered ahead. Names like Netflix and Amazon, NVIDIA, and Google Parent Alphabet all jumped about 2% each. That helped push the tech heavy NASDAQ to a new high. So, what happens next? We've had mostly banks and industrial stocks reporting. Banks have been okay, but not amazing. Industrials, though, have definitely been reporting better than expected. And the handful of consumer names, like Kimberly Clark, have been strong as well. So to keep this momentum going, we need to hear from technology stocks, energy stocks, and especially healthcare stocks. Healthcare has suddenly become a bit of a problem child for the markets. The market's being pushed up by a very small group of super performers, so the rally needs to broaden out. There's only 13 new highs on the S&P 500 today. So what else is missing? How about a little volume and a little volatility? Both are still surprisingly low. The question now becomes, will new highs draw greater interest from the investing public than we've seen so far? For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. And as Bob just mentioned, earnings were a big part of today's big rally. So we asked Dominic Chu to take a closer look at those four Dow components that reported today. United Technologies, Coke, P&G, and Verizon. The four big member stocks of the Dow Jones Industrial Index that reported today all had some generally positive news. We'll start with United Technologies, the aerospace and industrial conglomerate, posted earnings that were ahead of analyst estimates on better than expected sales. It also raised its full year profit forecast. United Technologies was helped along by better demand for its aircraft parts, but did say full year results would be hurt by the grounding of Boeing 737 MAX model jets around the world. Coca-Cola. That earnings story was also well received by investors. The soft drink maker also posted an earnings beat on better than expected sales. Coca-Cola was aided by better sales of bottled water and a slate of new flavors in its existing flagship brands like orange vanilla flavored Coke. Also a positive report for Procter & Gamble as well as the consumer products company responsible for everything from Pampers diapers to Tide laundry detergent also came in with better than expected profits and sales and raised its forecast for a metric of sales growth not driven by acquisition or foreign currency fluctuations. Procter & Gamble was able to raise prices to offset input costs. And we'll end with Verizon after America's biggest wireless phone carrier posted better than expected profits, but sales fell just shy of analyst forecasts. It reported a loss of both monthly contract phone subscribers and Fios TV video customers, but it did add Fios broadband internet customers. Now tomorrow, big Dow components slated to report include Boeing and Caterpillar before the opening bell and Microsoft and Visa after the closing bell. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. 
So what's next for this market now that the S&P and the Nasdaq are at new highs? Joining us tonight, Alicia Levine is chief strategist at BNY Mellon. Alicia, good to see you again. Welcome back. Hi, Bill. Thanks to have me. So are, are the, the concerns about a global economic slowdown that plagued the market last uh, in the fourth quarter of last year, is that not a concern now? So it's not that it's not a concern. It's just that it looks like we've bottomed. And it looks like the weakness that we saw in the fourth quarter and the concerns that we came into the year with actually are beginning to flatten out. So instead of a global synchronized downturn, we actually have a global synchronized flattening. And that actually has been very good for risk assets because it looks like we're out of the trough. And that with China stabilizing, right. we'll start to see green shoots in the emerging markets and as well in Europe. Speaking of China, what would a trade deal mean to this market right now? Is it already there, priced in? Well, that's a really great question, because I think for the most part, the trade deal has been priced in. But the issue is, what kind of trade deal? Yeah. I think a trade deal that gets rid of the tariffs would move the market higher. Any trade deal that keeps the tariffs in place as an enforcement mechanism might be seen as a disappointment to investors because the investors are looking for a trade deal to help goose earnings a little bit and to move multiples higher. One trend that we keep hearing about uh, this earnings season are higher costs, whether it's wage inflation or higher raw material costs. Is that a concern for you? It's not a concern yet because many companies have been able to pass on higher raw material costs to the consumers. So we don't quite see a trend yet. I do think margins will be a little bit softer in the first half, but I expect in the second half that should that should be getting a little bit better. And indeed, if you look at earnings estimates for the full year for 2019, the bulk of the earnings estimates increases are really coming in the third and the fourth quarter. And that's what we're counting on to drive the year higher. Sectors you like right now, are you, are you getting the numbers you're after in those groups that you like? So investors really have to decide what they believe here because the U.S. market is now trading at the, av the five-year average for the multiple because we've retraced all that downturn from the fourth quarter. So you have to believe, you have to decide if you believe that we're in a cyclical recovery or if this is just a flattening and a downturn. If you believe that the economy is getting better here in the U.S., right. and if you believe that the global economy is getting better, then you have to turn to financials, industrials, tech. And I would also point out what you've mentioned earlier, that healthcare has really been decimated because of the political chatter here in the U.S. Right. And it's always interesting to look at sectors when the multiple's been compressed, and I would certainly look at that here. All right, very good. Alicia Levine with BNY Mellon. Good to see you again. Thanks for Thank joining. Thank you. All right. Elsewhere, Iran is now reportedly threatening to close the Strait of Hormuz, the world's busiest transit lane for oil shipments. This, of course, in response to the White House's announcement yesterday that buyers of Iranian oil must stop making those purchases or face sanctions. According to Barclays, about 20 percent of all seaborne uh, crude passes through the Strait of Hormuz. Price of domestic crude continued higher today, closing above $66 a barrel. And as we've been reporting, the spring housing market is shaping up to be a bit unpredictable. I mean, today we learned that sales of newly built homes rose last month, one day after we learned that sales of existing homes fell. Diana Olick tries to make sense of it all. The nation's home builders are putting up fewer homes now than they were a year ago, but they suddenly seem to be selling more. Single family housing starts dropped 11% in March, but sales of new homes gained 3%. The cause of the disparity is likely pretty simple, mortgage rates. They rose throughout much of the second half of last year, peaking at over 5% on the 30 year fixed in November. That had builders pretty bearish on the prospects for this spring, likely why we saw fewer homes started. But rates then began falling this year and really plummeted in March when spring shoppers were out in force, hence the bump in sales. Pulte, one of the nation's largest builders, reported strong earnings in the first quarter of this year. Its CEO points squarely to the surprise drop in rates. One quarter into 2019 and roughly 70 basis points lower on mortgage rates over the past five months, Expectations are changing yet again, with some calling for a reacceleration of housing demand. 
Of course, the wild card is still prices. The median price of a new home sold in March was down nearly 10% compared with a year ago. Builders are trying to put up cheaper homes with stripped down amenities, but given the sky high costs for land and labor, doing so might help sales, but could hit builder bottom lines. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. Time to take a look at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. Qualcomm was upgraded to overweight from equal weight today at Morgan Stanley. The analyst cited last week's legal truce with Apple, which he says will result in stronger growth and earnings for the chipmaker. Price target $95. Shares rose 5.5% today to 86.72. Kimberly Clark was upgraded to outperform from neutral at Macquarie. The analyst cited the company's improving earnings outlook. Price target now $142. That stock fell 3.5% to $125.62. And Hormel was downgraded to underweight from neutral at J.P. Morgan. The analyst cited rising hog prices, which could be difficult to pass along to consumers. Price target $36. That stock was down nearly 3% to $39.24. Still ahead, feeling more confident about your retirement? You're not alone. For the first time, a drug distributor is facing criminal charges related to the opioid crisis. Rochester Drug Cooperative was charged today with conspiring to distribute drugs and defrauding the federal government. Two former company officials were also charged. But a settlement with the company has been reached. The government will not prosecute Rochester as long as it pays a $20 million fine. Rochester Drug Cooperative is the nation's sixth largest drug distributor. Elsewhere, two pharmaceutical chains said today that they're going to raise the age the customers are allowed to buy tobacco to 21. Walgreens was the first to make that announcement. Its new policy goes into effect starting September 1st. And then late in the day, Rite Aid announced the same policy. It will take effect within 90 days. All of this follows a crackdown by the FDA to stop retailers from selling cigarettes and other tobacco products to young people. And last week, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said he would propose raising the federal age limit on tobacco sales to 21. Well, it's something we do almost every day. We shop. And that simple act of shopping produces a legion of data. And that data is then often made anonymous and aggregated before getting sold to hedge funds. And those hedge funds then spend billions of dollars a year on the data that can help them get an edge on their trading. Leslie Picker explains this complicated and not very transparent web of transactions and who's profiting off your data and how. You're on your way to purchase something. Say it's a new pair of pants. You park your car at the store. Satellites from the commercial space industry see you pull up. They sell data about that parking lot and thousands of others to a firm called Orbital Insight. Orbital Insight analyzes these pictures to see where and when people are shopping. They say consumer traffic can give them an early sense of same-store sales and revenue ahead of earnings. But it doesn't end there. There are at least 100 apps, including weather and traffic apps, that are selling geolocation data. A firm called Thassos buys info about foot traffic and then spits out insights like how many customers visited a store in any given day and sells that to investors. When you purchase those pants, companies are tracking that too. Yodli provides consumer apps to some of the nation's largest banks and often gets access to their customers' credit card transaction history, which it then sells to investors, anonymized, of course. Your emailed receipt for those pants is also valuable. That data is pulled through services like Rakuten Intelligence's Unroll.me. This software rids your inbox of junk, but in doing so, the software gets a look and can gather information about purchasing habits to sell to hedge 
funds. Unroll.me says their technology can automatically recognize commercial emails and doesn't look at or share personal ones. And if you post about your new pants on social media, you better believe a whole host of firms are scraping through Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to gather sentiment data about the top retail brands. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Leslie Picker. By the way, Leslie tells us there are currently more than 400 firms collecting these data sets and selling them to hedge funds. Twitter says its campaign to clean up its platform is working, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus with the social media company saying this morning they had better than expected results as it saw an 11% rise in what they call monetizable daily active users. Those are users most likely to see advertisements. Twitter also said the strong quarter was a byproduct of weeding out fake and abusive accounts as well as better targeting ads. Shares jumped 15.5% today to 39.77. Elsewhere, Philip Morris reported better than expected earnings thanks to strong demand for its smoke-free products. But the tobacco company reported a decline in revenue and lowered its earnings guidance for the whole year. The stock today was up a fraction to 84.91. Lockheed Martin's better-than-expected earnings for the quarter were helped by strong demand for its missiles and fighter jets, and so the defense contractor raised its annual profit forecast. The stock was up just over 5.5% today to 333.10. And Harley-Davidson reported higher first-quarter earnings, but the motorcycle company did continue to face declining sales. Harley said that European Union tariffs were partially to blame for that. Shares were down 2% today to 38.92. Americans are more optimistic now about their retirement. A new survey by the Employee Benefits Research Institute says that this percentage of workers and retirees who think that they have enough saved has reached the highest level since before the financial crisis. But are they right? Our senior personal finance correspondent Sharon Epperson is here with highlights from that report. Uh, so how confident are people right now? Well, you can wish, you can dream, right? And so many <laughs> workers are having that dream. They're very confident, or at least they're somewhat confident, about their ability to retire comfortably. And 67% of workers now say that they have, they do believe now that they'll be able to retire comfortably in retirement. The key, though, is that the economy has done well, their financial situation has improved, and that may have colored their confidence and perhaps their overly confidence. In fact, 82 percent of retirees say that they're somewhat confident or very confident they'll, they'll be able to continue to live comfortably during these golden years. On the other side, though, how far behind are some Americans in saving for retirement? They definitely have some catching up to do. There are a number of people that haven't even done the calculations yet on how many how much it's going to cost them to retire and what they're going to need to live comfortably all of those years. 42 percent, that's only the number that have done that type of calculation. And only 29 percent, that's less than one in three people, have actually calculated how much money they're going to need for probably their biggest expense, and that is health care expenses. And what about the people already in retirement? They're confident that they'll be able to continue in retirement, That 82% right? is pretty astounding, but a lot of it has to do with that big number for retirement savings that they'll be needing for their health care expenses. Fidelity has estimated that you're going to need $285,000 if you're a 65-year-old couple retiring today. And 8 out of 10 workers, according to the EBRI study, said they actually believe that they're confident they're going to be able to cover those medical expenses in retirement. The reality of whether or not they're able to do that, based on how much retirement savings they actually have, that's the big question mark. And then there's another factor in all this, and we want you to stay right there, Sharon, yeah. because we want to pick up on a topic that we brought you yesterday and that is this new report that showed that Social Security and Medicare may run out of money in the not-too-distant future. So how can Americans plan for a potential Social Security shortfall? Joining us right now, Liz Miller, who's with Summit Place Financial Advisors. Liz, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. So Medicare, the report says, would be out of money by 2026, not too far down the road, and, Medi uh, and Social Security by 2035. How realistic should people be to plan for those incomes as they get ready for retirement? Well, I think they need to make very specific plans for taking care of themselves. When we talk to um, those in their 50s, and to me, that's the real market that's affected by this. They're looking out potentially 15 years plus before they retire, and that's coming right against those Social Security estimates. So we have a lot of clients in that age frame asking us, what do we do? What does it look like if there is no additional income? 
The savers that are younger than that, most of them aren't even thinking Social Security. So I'm not as worried about that population, particularly really even of the 30-year-olds. If they are saving, they totally believe it's all on themselves. But our clients that are in the 50s, we're starting to look at, well, let's see what you have and what does it look like without that extra income. And what about health care? I mean, that is a huge concern for a lot of people as they get closer to retirement age, right? It is, and those numbers are scary, coming up very quickly. I think there is part of the population who's sort of ignoring it, sure that something will change. Somehow this will get fixed. And as we know, that can be very dangerous. Um, the fidelity estimates, of course, are pretty high, but we like to put into perspective uh, the estimates are for a couple. And really, almost two-thirds of those estimated expenses are for what is now Medicare premiums and prescription kind of expenses. Right. So one of the things I like to talk to couples about is what are you spending now for health care insurance and what are you doing? Because what they worry about is thinking that that big nut is a completely unplanned catastrophe. And that's not what experience shows us. And you've done a lot of work on how much people are going to have to pay and get ready to pay when they get to retirement on health care. Well, when they get ready for retirement on health care, they're going to have to pay a substantial amount. The other thing they have to remember is when they think they're going to retire at 65, which many workers say they're going to do, many more are retiring at 62 right. or before they think they're going to because of a health care emergency, because of a disability, because of job loss. What happens then because you can't get Medicare until you're 65? So how are you going to pay for those health care expenses earlier on? That's something else that, that a lot of people need to think about now. I don't want to be complacent about this, but I can remember when I was in my 30s and the warnings were that I shouldn't wait for re uh, uh, Social Security to be there when I'm getting ready to retire. And here I am getting ready to retire at some point, uh, and, it's, and it's still solvent right now. Right, right. So are we, are we whistling past the graveyard here? Well, demographics have a lot to do with Social Security, and, and somehow that's kind of the rut we're in at the moment because the millennials were sort of delayed in starting their careers. If there are enough younger people working, putting into Social Security, it helps the rest of us get right. through. So it, it's the ultimate of a... Good pyramid scheme. All right. Liz Miller with Summit Place Financial Advisors. Thank you. Sharon, as always, thank cool. you for being with us tonight as well. Coming up, the transformation of American malls. The FAA and the Department of Transportation have now given a drone startup clearance for deliveries. This is the first time a drone company has received the same government approval as an airline. The startup is called Wing. It's a division of Google's parent company, Alphabet. And Wing says the approval means it can now start commercial deliveries from local businesses to homes. Well, it's no secret that the way we shop is changing, and so malls across the country have to evolve to keep up with the new demands and to keep shoppers spending. Courtney Reagan takes a look for us tonight. The American Mall. It may not be the gathering place of the 80s and 90s, but extinction headlines take it too far. They're not dying, they're just changing. It's true that more than a quarter of the nation's malls have closed. CoreSight counts 19,500 store closure announcements in the U.S. since 2017. Some from bankruptcies due partially to heavy debt burdens, but also lower sales and margins as more shopping moves online. Anchor locations are the biggest traffic drivers, making them the most important and most expensive to replace. But Green Street Advisors estimates malls will be more than 93% occupied this year. That's above the historical average. Last year, tenant sales were the best in six years. Mall operators are getting creative, filling empty real estate with experiences, things you can't buy on Amazon. Things like axe throwing, um, things where people can go and participate in some sort of experience. These used to be in remote locations, now they're coming to your shopping center. There's an escape room where a now bankrupt limited and limited two store used to be in New Jersey's Woodbridge Mall. This Lifetime Fitness in Edina, Minnesota is where JCPenney used to be. It even has a water park. 
The American Dream Mall in New Jersey has changed hands three times in the 16 years since it was first conceived. Now run by the family that owns Minneapolis's Mall of America, it's almost ready to open. With an indoor snow park, a DreamWorks branded indoor water park, aquarium, Cirque du Soleil venue, hockey rink and Vice Media food hall. With over half the tenants entertainment or food, it will hardly feel like a mall at all. We are a consuming public. We like to shop, we like to have experiences. I don't believe retail as a category is headed toward Armageddon. I think it's headed toward repositioning. Brookfield, the country's biggest mall owner, now has Peloton stores, Tesla showrooms, and supermarkets. Today, the best shopping centers are curated about 30, 35% apparel, 20% home furnishings, 20% entertainment, 15 to 18% food, 10% electronic and digitally native companies, which is sort of the biggest flow of tenants into our shopping centers. Simon Property Group owns some of the strongest malls in the country. In recent years, its tenant composition has changed with fewer pure clothing stores and the addition of 15 brands that started online, like Warby Parker, Casper, and Untuck It. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Courtney Reagan. Finally tonight, today marks the anniversary of one of the biggest product flops ever, New Coke. Remember that? It was launched on this date in 1985, and the backlash was swift. Consumers were upset about the iconic soda's shift in flavor. New Coke didn't exactly disappear immediately, but it was joined only two months later by Coca-Cola Classic. And then in 2002, it was taken off the market for good. You might say it was a corporate decision that left a bad taste in some people's mouths. Sorry. One final look at the day on the street. The Dow was up 145 points. The Nasdaq and the S&P with their gains today, all-time highs. That is Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Bill Griffith. Thanks for watching. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow.